Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll give it a minute just so everybody can come on in and I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. I'm just so grateful that you're all uh, joining us this evening. I'm really excited about this presentation. Uh, March is Fish Consumption Month. And so the Stop, Check, Enjoy campaign centers around sustenance fishing in the Cape Fear River and seeks to help at-risk families on when, what, and how they can consume fish from the river safely. Um, but grant funding is ending for this incredible program. And so it would, it's really gonna be up to us and a couple other organizations in the community to continue carrying this message forward. Um, and that's really where you guys come in. Our Coastal ambassadors and volunteers, we're going to be really relying on you to help us find the communities that can, um, you know, benefit from this education and this message the most. Um, it's definitely very near and dear to us in our environmental justice work and working with those underserved communities. Um, and it's really exciting what they've been able to do. Um, and without Further ado, um, I would love to um, uh, pass it on to these fantastic folks here this evening. Um, we'll be hearing from these researchers and our, uh, the program coordinator, Kiara, from the Duke Superfund Research Center Community Engagement Corps, otherwise known as CEC. The CEC partnered with Cape Fear River Watch and a team of community health educators near Wilmington to share information about fish consumption advisories with people who catch and eat fish from the Northeast Cape Fear River. Um, and so now I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pass over to Kiara. Sure, thank you so much, Bonnie. And thank you everyone for being here with us this evening. Um, I know it's late in the day, maybe everyone's kind of ready for dinner. So I'm really glad that you're with us and we're really excited to share this information with you all. Um, as Bonnie said, my name is Kiara. I am the program coordinator for the Community Engagement Corps of the Duke University Superfund Research Center. Uh, our presentation today, we're calling this Behind the Stop, Check and Enjoy campaign, Toxic Chemicals in Cape Fear River Fish. Uh, we will explain a little bit about uh, what that Stop, Check and Enjoy campaign actually is, but hopefully maybe some of y'all have heard of it already. Um, and thank you, Bonnie, for that wonderful introduction. It is really important to mention that, um, like Bonnie said, this, this uh, mandate is going to be ending for us relatively soon. So we're really going to rely on our wonderful partner organizations like Coastal Federation and like you all as the Coastal Ambassadors to kind of continue this work. Um, Okay, so we can advance the next slide. And I will uh, let Moshkan and Abby introduce themselves. <laughs> go ahead, Abby, sorry. Okay, I can go first. So I am Abigail Joyce or Abby Joyce. I am a research scientist at Duke University um, where I met Kiara and the group kind of taking charge on this project. I, I manage the analytical chemistry core for the Superfund Research Center. So they reached out to me to kind of help with their chemical analysis and chemical interpretation of all of these results. I also do a lot of work on PFAS chemical contamination in water, which I know is really relevant um, in the area. So that is what I do here. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Moshkan Rajai and I am a faculty member at Oakland University in Michigan, uh, but I uh, spent a year uh, as a visiting faculty member at Duke and that's where I connected um, with another faculty member, uh, Dr. Liz Shapiro Garza um, on this project and we started talking about that and my work is really in environmental health. I'm in a teach in a public health program. Um, with a focus on environmental health and environmental exposures and environmental justice. And so I'm uh, going to tell you more about all of the work that we did um, in a little bit. Thank you, guys. And again, I'm Kiara. Um, and we can move to the next slide. So the flow of this um, 
presentation tonight, I, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the origin of this project, the background, um, a little bit more about the work that we do overall um, on, around fish consumption, and then I will turn it over to Moshkan and Abby, who um, so elegantly described the science behind um, how we know what we know, um, which is really interesting and hopefully relevant to all of you. So just to start, um, basically this project started way back in 2016. Uh, there was some community activism, some grassroots community activism around um, Titan Cement putting in a plant along the banks of the river. Um, now y'all being from, you know, living in the area, you know that Titan was, is and was far from the only uh, source of pollution, potential pollution in the area. Um, but as community activists were kind of out in the world on the ground, they were noticing that people were fishing from the river, from the banks of the river, um, and that they were not, it was not catch and release. So they were ostensibly taking that fish home and consuming it or giving it to their family or sharing it with friends. Um, so that observation was made, um, and so community activists were concerned, and they wanted some data to be able to back that up, um, back up their observations. So they partnered with Duke, and we were able to secure an Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Environmental Justice Grant that allowed us to continue to do this work um, and to, to get some real data on it. So these numbers that you see here, um, these were taken from two separate surveys, and, and basically these percentages communicate to us that um, there is a connection between the people who are fishing out of the river uh, and the low income or food insecure population. So um, this 44% was taken from a household survey where uh, researchers went around and knocked on folks doors um, and they took note of the demographics in the various neighborhoods. And so uh, they concluded that about 44%, almost 50% um, of families in low income neighborhoods were eating fish from the river. Um, similar number with the bank side fishers, 59%, um, so a little over half were actually eating the fish they were catching from the river. That was kind of our baseline for this work. Um, we also found out, uh, based on these two surveys, that a lot of people, a significant portion of the, the people fishing from the river were actually sharing that fish with other people, um, which might not seem relevant at first, but it is important when you consider the people that they might be sharing with. And we'll talk a little bit more about sort of what constitutes a vulnerable population, um, but they can be sharing with people who might be more adversely affected by the health impacts. Um, we also were able to determine frequency of uh, consuming fish. So most people uh, were eating one to three meals per month from a fish from the Cape Fear River. Um, and again, we'll get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty on portion size, but we would determine that based on our, our definition of portion size. Um, for each meal, most people were eating one to two portions of fish, um, which is significant when we talk about kind of meal limits and portion limits. So this work has to kind of be placed in the context of already existing fish consumption advisory. So I'm not sure if any of y'all have seen a fish consumption advisory, but it essentially looks like this image here on the screen. Um, and they are put out by the Department of Environmental Quality and they are based on um, data that was gathered in this case, quite a while ago, um, but these fish consumption advisories technically are supposed to be posted at um, boat ramps and fishing piers and also exist online. Um, but as we'll talk about a little bit more, they are actually quite difficult to access sometimes and they're not always posted in visible places. Um, they're a little bit difficult just to understand. They contain a lot of nuance. Um, but kind of the basics of what a fish consumption advisory consists of is it tells you the species that's being referenced, uh, the location or body of water that's being referenced, kind of the average contaminant level that we're talking about and the types of contaminant levels, and then it gives some recommendations based on, based on the data. Um, so again, you know, Duke Superfund is not responsible for fish consumption advisories. These predated uh, our work and our research, but it's important to know that there, there is and was kind of information that existed. It just needed some updating and refining and we wanted to make sure that people were actually getting this information in a way that was accessible to them. So here we're going to show you a chart um, just to kind of demonstrate our knowledge of what people are eating from the river. So the types of fish that people are eating. 
Um, the caveat here is that this is all kind of self-reported. Um, we don't have a ton, a ton of data. We, we you know, are, we're fairly limited in the amount of people we, we were able to tap. Um, also kind of culturally, cross-culturally, there are different names for fish species. So people were not always positive what they were catching. Um, but generally the commonly consumed species are this uh, list here and in yellow are kind of the most popular. So you have kind of your large fish, catfish, uh, your types of bass, um, red and black drum, speckled trout. So kind of those big meaty delicious fish that, that people are familiar uh, with eating. Now uh, this kind of addition to the chart shows which of these specifically were, will focus kind of on the most popular fish, which of these had fish consumption advisories associated with them um, and which chemicals, chemical contaminants um, the fish advisories uh, covered. So we have mercury, arsenic and hexavalent chromium. And you'll see that there's um, quite a few mercury advisories that already exist. We kind of know the most about mercury just in general. Um, and then there was only um, one advisory for arsenic, one for hexavalent chromium. Um, and the kind of locations in parentheses are the physical locations that these advisories apply to. So somewhat limited in scope. And so when Duke Superfund kind of jumped on this work and we got that grant and we started to do some research and, and partner with other organizations, um, we were focusing on this main problem, which is that people were observed fishing from the banks of the river um, and were likely taking that fish home to eat or to share with their family. Um, and so what we needed to know, the knowledge gaps we kind of needed to attend to, um, how toxic and how many of these toxic chemicals and in what quantities are in the fish, um, what are the health risks from eating the fish for folks that are consuming, and how can we most effectively, this is the really big one, reach people eating the fish in order to reduce, help to reduce those risks. So those were our guiding premises. And we were fortunate enough and continue to be fortunate enough to partner with some really amazing organizations, um, Cape Fear River Watch being one of them. And then of course, NC Coastal Fed. Um, we also work with the NAACP of New Hanover County. We try to work as closely as possible with county health departments and also extension offices. Um, and then we partner as well with some of the more kind of biology, ecology centered organizations like Wildlife Resources um, and the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries. Uh, and just for a little bit of a timeline, uh, we definitely don't need to go through every point on this timeline, but just to kind of start back at the beginning, like I mentioned, the grant that initially kicked off our research, we were awarded in 2016. Um, and in that year, we were able to conduct the household survey. Um, we conducted some focus groups in 2018. Um, and then kind of the uh, product of those focus groups in the survey was the Stop, Check, and Joy campaign, which is our social marketing campaign. It's how we get the word out into the world. Um, there were a couple of master's projects that came out of this work. So uh, master's students at Duke, myself included, um, jumped on this research and were able to kind of move it forward a bit. Um, and then the most recent uh, fish tissue analysis was actually conducted um, just in 2020, 2021. So that was that's kind of the, the fish tissue research that Moshkan and Abby are going to be able to tell you a little bit more about. So I'm going to take over here and just talk a little bit about the process of how we collected fish to, to test for different uh, chemicals. Uh, so what we did is first we had to figure out what we were doing and what the process of how to do this in a way that the Department of or the Division of Public Health in North Carolina could use. And also there's a thunderstorm um, where I'm at in Michigan, so I don't know if you can hear anything. Hopefully the power stays on. Uh, but uh, so we had to figure out that process. This is a way to, this flow chart is really to outline the process where we had to come up with the sampling plan, plan working with the Division of Public Health. We have to sample species that are higher and lower on the food chain. So those are lower and higher food uh, trophic levels. Um, and that's to show like things that can biomagnify and bioaccumulate in fish. Um, so moving up the food chain. And then we had to sample in our plan, figure out, make sure we had enough of each fish that we were sampling from each site. So we sampled at multiple sites. Did we have those different trophic levels of species represented? 
Do we have at least five fillets or three composites? Composites are used when you have really small fish and you want to kind of get a more robust bit of data because they're small. So you take three to seven individual fish and you mix them all together. You homogenize them, which basically makes it all kind of the chemicals all evenly distributed. So you can then test that. And that's actually a really robust, like strong measure of like, okay, you're actually sampling maybe five fish right there um, in your one result that you get. Those get analyzed by a lab that's approved by the state, follow certain protocols. Um, and then from there, you get a certain amount of like a metal, like mercury in the fish. We then go through a screening level review. And so there's a screening level of like, all right, is this level of concern or not? If the amount in the fish is below that screening level, and this is the same one that the EPA and the Division of Public Health use, then there's no advisory necessary. And these are levels, the screening levels are really low. This is meant to be like, just to check if you're above that, let's look into it further. If it's not, we know it should be perfectly safe for everyone. Now, if it's above the screening level, it triggers them that we have to calculate and figure out what's a recommended meal limit. So the maximum of fish somebody should eat that's considered potentially safe. Um, and then you look at what's the calculation give you. If it's less than seven, then you're saying that somebody should eat less, no more than seven meals, right, per, me per week. Um, and so if you have more than seven, you're basically telling someone you could eat this a meal every day of the week and you're going to be perfectly fine. So we looked into it because it was above the screening level, but it was just a little bit above it and it's not a concern, right? Then no advisory is issued. However, if it's less than seven, that means you need to be careful about how much you're eating per week. And so it gets reviewed by a risk manager at the Division of Public Health. And then that's when they issue a fish consumption advisory. And so we had to really try to figure out this process. It wasn't really known. So we're trying to like demystify, like, what do we actually do? So a lot of this process was us figuring it out um, because it wasn't entirely clear. So in order to do this, we had to come up with a plan. And we did this in partnership with um, and working with uh, the Division of Public Health. Um, so first we had to figure out like, where are we going to sample? What are the top fishing spots? We had to figure out which species we were going to sample. We need them to be from high and low trophic levels. Uh, and then we need to figure out what are we actually sampling for? So in terms of the figuring out the spots, we sampled at five different sites um, within the lower Cape Fear, and you can see them indicated here. Uh, and part of the reason we sampled at these sites is because there hasn't been a lot of research in the Lower Cape Fear, uh, and none of these sites have been sampled since 2013. So in nine years, there's been no data collected to understand contaminant risks in fish. So we knew it was important in a gap, but then we also knew that some of these sites like Davis Creek um, and uh, Burt Mill Creek near Archie Blue Park uh, in Wilmington hadn't really been sampled at all. And so there was a lack of data. And even the data we had, don't have a lot of data on red drum, um, even bluegill in some of these areas, not well known, or blue crab. So we wanted to expand um, the, the sampling at these sites because we know people are fishing there. So we had to then figure out which species were we going to sample. And I mentioned a couple before that we didn't really have good data on. One of them was red drum, which uh, Kiara had mentioned, people we, from the prior surveys, people were consuming red drum also various catfishes. Uh, so we said we wanted to select um, some catfish. Uh, we want to do bofin because bofin's high on the uh, trophic level and people eat it. Um, red drum because it was popular. Um, and then bluegill lower on the trophic level and is sometimes eaten. Not as favorable as some other fish, but still eaten sometimes and uh, low on the trophic level. And then we did blue crab because it's blue crab, people eat it. Uh, and so we had to figure out, um, right, these species. We did different species of catfish just because of practically, which, you, you know, you take the fish you get <laughs> when you're trying to catch them. So we ended up collecting them at different sites. So what you'll see is flathead catfish we sampled at Burnt Mill Creek, uh, but we didn't sample it anywhere else. And that's just because that was where the flathead catfish were there when we were sampling. Red Drum was just at uh, Brunswick River, because this is a more brackish water site, um, which is also where we sampled blue crab. Um, but then some fish like bowfin and bluegill, we sampled at all of the sites because they were more common and universal at the sites. 
What we then did, and don't worry about all the details of this table, it's very large, I'm sorry, um, but I'm gonna try and distill the main points for you. We had to collect a bunch of fish at each of those five sites. Um, so if these different species, we sampled three species at each site in of those five sites, right? So you have 15 different sets of fish that we're collecting. So we ended up collecting 131 fish total. Some of those were actually composites, right? Where you have three to seven fish um, in one sample. So we had uh, 21 composite samples, uh, which represent a lot more individuals, um, but then you had 36 fillets. So what that means is then we had um, about 57 total samples of fillet and composite samples, um, but that represents 131 fish. All of those were analyzed for certain metals, mercury, arsenic, and chromium, which Abby's going to talk about in a moment. Um, but then we selected five other fish to analyze for PCBs and dioxins. We did this separately because it's more expensive to analyze for PCBs and dioxins, multiple times more expensive, in fact. So we weren't able to analyze all of our fish for PCBs and dioxins. Uh, we did, uh, of our 131 fish that we sampled for metals, um, we are in the process, we don't have results yet, um, of getting them analyzed also for PFAS. Um, so that is something in the works, but we just don't have data yet. Some of the fish that we sampled, um, we only had, so for example, uh, blue catfish, we only got um, one sample. So it didn't meet our threshold of what was needed for informing a fish consumption advisory. So we did have some fish we collected, but we weren't able to get enough just because the fish weren't there when we sampled, um, or we weren't able to get them enough in the amount of time. So we sampled three composites of blue crab, but they were have to be within a week. Um, and we didn't know this ahead of time, found out afterwards that we missed the window, timing window for them. So the reasons we collected these species, as I mentioned before, is because we didn't have a lot of data on these species. Uh, and so part of it is just, um, this is the fish that we sampled. And you can see for some of these red drum, flathead catfish, channel catfish, um, blue crab, blue catfish, we didn't have much data on them. And this is looking at over time, um, we really didn't have a lot anything sampled since 2013 and this need to fill kind of these gaps around popular fish at these sites. So I'm going to pass over to Abby and let her tell you more about the contaminants we selected. Yes, yeah, so um, as Moshpan kind of mentioned to earlier, we looked for three different metals, arsenic, chromium, and mercury. And then we also looked for non-metal contaminants called PCBs and dioxins. Um, so a little bit more about what PCBs and dioxins are and why they're so expensive to analyze for. They're actually two separate groups of compounds. So there are 209 different PCBs that are um, possible to make. There's about 185 different um, dioxins that are possible. And of those, there's about 36 different dioxins that are environmentally relevant and incredibly toxic. And there's um, 28 different PCBs on EPA's PCB watch list. So there's 28 different PCB chemicals that um, are abundant in the environment and have um, a known toxicity and are known to be present. So because there had been um, advisories on arsenic, chromium, and mercury before, and we know PCBs and dioxins are present in the area, that's the list that we chose to um, focus on for chemicals to look for. There's a lot of data on mercury um, and not a lot of data on chromium, arsenic, PCBs, or dioxins. I also kind of want to measure some of the subtleties that, or mention some of the subtleties with chromium and arsenic. So these chemicals also exist in different forms in the environment. Arsenic um, has an organic form and an inorganic form that you'll hear about. Um, we assumed, we measured total arsenic and assumed that 10% of that measurement was inorganic arsenic, which is the toxic form of arsenic that we have to worry about. 
Um, there's two different forms of chromium that exist in the world. Primarily there's chrome six, as you'll hear it referred to, and chrome three. Um, chromium three is um, very abundant in the environment. It's an essential nutrient. It's uh, naturally occurring. Um, chromium six is also a little bit naturally occurring, but it's the compact, it's the form of chromium that they use in industry a lot. And it also happens to be much more toxic to animals and um, much more available for to um, get into and concentrate within animal tissues. So those are the chemicals that we wanted to look for. If we go to the next slide, um, we can talk a little bit about um, their presence in, in North Carolina. So all five of these chemicals um, come from Superfund sites, energy production, chromium plating, paper production. It's kind of long list of um, known sources of all these chemicals. And once they're released into the environment, they tend to contaminate, they tend to um, concentrate in the water, they'll concentrate in the soil and the sediment. And once they're there, it's hard to get those out of the environment. And that's where they get into a fish and that's where they get into wildlife. And once they're in the fish, um, that presents um, us as people with a direct exposure to concentrating them in our own bodies, right? That um, and once they're in people, they have known adverse health outcomes. Um, a lot of their adverse outcomes are the same, even though they're different chemicals. So we have a lot of neurological outcomes, cancer, um, just getting sick in general, um, reproductive issues, neurological issues, and endocrine effects. Um, so if you think about the neurological issues, the reproductive issues, and the endocrine effects that these chemicals have, um, the body burden of that on, on small children can exacerbate those problems. So that's where we get into vulnerable populations should be consuming different amounts than grown adults. So um, children who are um, kind of continuing their brain growth, continuing to regulate hormones, they should be more concerned. Their risks are a little bit higher for consuming fish that could have high mercury, high chromium, high PCB and dioxin um, concentrations. And that also includes um, pregnant women in that vulnerable population who could be um, exposing their babies to these chemicals. And so when we get into what we found in these um, fish that Marshawn described, we find that um, the good news is we did not really find, we found no dioxins in any of the fish tested, which is great news considering dioxins are by far and away the most toxic chem chemicals that we tested for. Um, we did find um, PCBs, so at least one PCB was measured in each fish that we measured. Um, I'd like to remind you that we only looked for dioxins and PCBs in five fish because the analysis was so expensive. But what we did was we looked in the fish that were most likely to have high dioxin and PCB concentration. So the fattiest fish we could find, we looked for dioxins and PCBs. And in both cases, for both compounds, in all fish, the dioxin and PCB concentrations were well below any screening levels that would cause concern. So, what does that mean? Well, um, so that just means essentially that the health risks associated with PCBs and dioxins um, are not large, but likely more driven by the metals. So the metal contamination in the fish is really what's driving toxicity and um, uh, I, I'm losing all my words today. <laughs> so anyway, metals are what's causing toxicity but that doesn't mean that dioxins and PCBs aren't there. So what does it mean if we didn't detect any of these compounds? Basically, each fish that we collected has some amount of chemical contamination with these represented by these blue and green dots. So if we were assuming that dioxin was say these two green dots, when we extract the fish and we homogenize them, um, we get them into a solution and we get them into a place where we can put them on um, an instrument that will measure them. 
if there's a really, really small amount like what we have in these green dots, what the instrument gives us is just this um, kind of jagged line where there's no obvious peak, but there could be contamination. Whereas like in the sense of the PCBs, there was enough to make a beautiful peak that we could then measure and report back an actual number. So when we're reporting non-detects, we can get a number because we know what the minimum detection limit is, and we can back calculate what the maximum concentration of a, of a dioxin is based on where I know these peaks start to show up and I know it's below that number. Um, so if you're worried about PCBs and dioxins and you really like um, catfish or fattier fish, um, there are special ways that you can um, prepare your fish that we can talk about in the question section to kind of minimize um, your exposure to those chemicals, even though we know that we can't really find them, we know that they might also still be present. And I will hand it back over to Moshkan to talk about the metals that we found in all of the fish that we measure metals in. Thanks, Abby. Uh, so we measured um, arsenic, as Abby had mentioned, total arsenic. And we assume 10% is inorganic arsenic. And that's what the screening levels are based off of. So what you see here is I'll show you a graph for each of the three metals and showing the different species of fish um, for all sites all combined together. And then the concentration of uh, inorganic arsenic, the estimated inorganic arsenic. And there are two lines here. Can arsenic can cause uh, or increase the risk of cancer, as well as have a number of other health impacts. So we have two screening levels. One is for cancer effects. That one is all the way down here and it looks like it's at zero. Um, and that's because cancer effects screening levels are usually really low because any amount of something that causes cancer increases your risk of cancer. And so we want people to be exposed to really low levels. So the level is very, very low. Um, and then you have a non-cancer effect level, screening level that's, that's higher. Uh, but what you see here is actually that all of our samples exceeded the screening levels for cancer effects, and that triggers further analysis. Uh, most of them, except for five bowfin samples um, from Burnt Mill Creek, did not exceed the non-cancer screening levels. Um, but still, right, that bowfin kind of triggers at least some further analysis for them. For chromium, we measured total chromium, but as uh, was mentioned, right, there's different forms. Um, we actually assume, and this is an EPA and North Carolina Division of Public Health um, protocol, is you assume that all of the chromium is hexavalent chromium or chrome-6. And that's because it's so toxic. And so here again, you see that the cancer screening level is very close to zero, and all of them exceeded the, all of our samples exceeded the cancer effects screening level. Um, none of them exceeded the non-cancer effects ones. Uh, so we see again, both in being high, but also red drum for chromium. For mercury, this is the metal we have the most data for. Um, and we're assuming this is methyl mercury, which is the organic type, which is most toxic. And mercury is bad, but it doesn't actually cause cancer. <laughs> so there's only a cancer effect screening level. Uh, and so in this case, most of our samples, in fact, all but one exceeded the screening level for non-cancer effects for mercury. Uh, so we knew, again, Bofin stood out in this case um, as kind of this top on, uh, top on the food chain um, animal, so it accumulates and magnifies more mercury. So what we had to do is take that information and figure out, well, how do you turn that into a fish consumption advisory? And so we got to this point where we needed to calculate safe meal limits, figure out what that is and figure out if an advisory is issued. And that's done by the Division of Public Health, but we wanted to do our own math essentially. So these are the old uh, fish consumption advisory guidelines. They're set for vulnerable populations, pregnant women, uh, women of childbearing age, children under the age of 15, and then everybody else fits in this other population. And so you can see the recommendations for catfish just at one meal per week. Um, and then um, for bowfin, one meal per week, blue crab, three, um, bluegill, and red drum, four. So we did the meal limit calculations for each of the three metals. You do it for each individual thing, uh, contaminant. So in this case, we did one for mercury, the non-cancer effects, arsenic cancer effects, and chromium cancer effects. 
And what this shows is uh, our data on uh, what were the, uh, the numbers of meals limits recommended based off of just mercury, arsenic, and chromium. And what you see here is that the ones that stand out are actually chromium. For all of them, chromium was the most limiting, right? Meaning that it wasn't mercury that was driving the meal limit recommendations to be lower um, in our analyses. It was actually chromium. Um, in one case, it was mercury for bofin, but for just mercury, you know, for catfish, you could eat three meals per week and it'd be fine. But you're not exposed to just mercury, right? You're also exposed to uh, chromium and arsenic. And so what you do then is you take the most limiting of these three metals, and then that means the most restrictive meal limit is one meal per week. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more just at the end of like, we're just looking at the most restrictive as if you're only exposed to one of these things at a time, and that's not true. So we found one per each of these different species. And this was a, a rounded about one. We didn't know the process. So we were like, eh, 0.9, we're going to say it's about one meal per week. But when we worked with the Division of Public Health, um, they came up with the official recommendations. And what that meant is that, uh, oops, there it is. Uh, these recommendations that used to be one meal limit for fit, all catfish, um, for channel catfish, it dropped down to uh, zero. Uh, so the real meal limit recommendation now is zero per week. Bofin down to zero as well. Um, bluegill went from four to one. We don't have enough data on um, blue catfish and blue crab, unfortunately. Those are the ones that didn't meet the threshold of enough samples within a week. Um, but all of these recommendations are kind of site-based. So it's based off of, is that the Cape Fear River, the Burnt Mill Creek, Davis Creek? It's all based off of where we got those fish from. Um, but these are major changes, right? Telling people, you know, you thought bluegill was fine, you could eat four meals per week. Now we're recommending only one. And this is for the other population. Unfortunately, there's no recommendation yet that's been provided for vulnerable populations, but we know that's another consideration. So these, you saw this chart before that Kiara uh, shared, uh, and what's listed in red here is the new fish consumption advisories um, that just went into place, oh my, I don't know, a couple months ago, time ago. October. October, there you go, more than just a couple months. <laughs> uh, and what you see is, again, they're site-based where we sampled, um, but they're all driven by hexavalent chromium in the fish not just mercury. Uh, so you can see where this type of research is really important because if we're just looking at mercury, which is what a lot of the research had done, you're missing the potential of this risk from hexavalent chromium in fish. All that being said, there's still a lot of limitations and things we have to figure out. So one, the advisories are for the other population, not vulnerable populations yet. Um, so that means the limits are probably going to be lower. So it's one, it's probably zero uh, for vulnerable populations. We didn't test for hexavalent chromium or inorganic arsenic. We did total amounts of all types of hexavalent chromium. So there's this question of like, well, is it all hexavalent chromium or is it just some of it? Other research shows that it probably is majority hexavalent chromium. So we want to assume and be safe and be as protective as possible because if it is 100% hexavalent chromium, that matters because it's a risk to people eating the fish. Uh, we also couldn't, there were some fish that didn't meet the threshold for sampling and uh, setting advisories, unfortunately, like blue crab that are quite popular, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, but also there, you know, the advisories are set for like, we sampled near Archie Blue Park, but fish don't stay in one spot, right? And so there's this confusion of like, well, who, how far does it apply? Because it's only based off of the sites that we sampled from. Um, so we can't actually make assumptions about other sites, but yet we do know it's likely to be somewhat similar. Uh, also, the advisories are set for like chromium only, mercury only. Um, and we don't have enough data on PCPs, so that's not even included here or dioxins. Uh, but you aren't exposed to just one of those things. You're exposed to the whole mishmash of chemicals. 
And so that means that, you know, your risk is cumulative, but we set the standard at an individual chemical level. So in some ways, it might not even be protective enough because of that, um, but because you know, we're, we're trying to balance, like, what's the uncertainties? How do we be most protective? But also, we know that people are going to eat fish, and we want people to eat fish. Um, and we only did it in certain contaminants, but there are others to think about. So the piece that comes up after all this work is like, are the fish safe to eat? Because, you know, looking at these recommendations, it's not very optimistic. How do I eat fish? Which fish do I eat and how do I do that safely? And so um, Kiara is going to talk about that piece of our work of thinking about the communications. Yeah, and I'll try to move through all of this relatively quickly because I, I would love to leave some time for questions at the end. And also all of these materials that I'm going to walk through are available online as well. So I highly encourage you, I'll try to share some links at the end to go online and kind of uh, look through all of this yourself. Um, but that Stop, Check, Enjoy social marketing campaign that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, that was developed actually prior to the 2020-2021 fish tissue analysis, but it was updated um, for based on that data. But basically, this social marketing campaign was designed to try to fill in some of the gaps that are in the fish consumption advisory communications um, and to make this information more accessible to the people who most need it. So we wanted to design materials um, that were going to kind of simplify all of this information, make it as straightforward as possible, make it as visually appealing as possible, um, share it widely in places that fish consumption advisories might not exist, um, like WIC clinics and SNAP clinics and places where people are already going to get this uh, health information. So the Stop, Check, Enjoy campaign um, is based around some uh, pretty broad messaging um, that we can distill down a little bit uh, now, but again, it's it, it would be uh, really helpful to all of you, I think, to really just look through a lot of these materials whenever you have time. Um, but the stop basically in the title refers to fish that um, we're going to pretty safely say uh, you should just steer clear of consuming if you can. Um, check would be to kind of check your fish consumption advisory specifically in your area, and especially if you do fall into that vulnerable population category that Moshkan was talking about and Abby earlier. Um, and then enjoy. Uh, again, the caveat being that we can't really say that any of these fish are totally, totally safe to eat and that you won't have any health impacts from them because um, they all do contain some level of contamination, most likely. Um, but enjoy are kind of the safer choices, um, especially if you don't really have um, much of an option in terms of whether you eat fish from the river or not. And that's another big kind of message behind the campaign um, is we're not telling people to, to not fish out of the river. We recognize that um, it's a really important protein source for a lot of people and their families, um, and that we can't just kind of point blank say um, not, not to eat the fish from the river. So this here on the screen is an example. Um, and uh, yeah, that's okay, you can move forward. Um, that was kind of our poster. And then we have uh, a wallet card, which is on the far left, uh, which is small and folded and can kind of slip right into your wallet. So that's great if you're a fisherman on the go. We want to be sure that people have that as a really easy reference. Um, we also have a calendar um, that contains actually a lot of great recipes that were recently updated based on the October advisories um, that give you uh, some meals to cook if you are catching fish and they are meals based on the fish that we would most recommend um, and our methods of prep and uh, cooking that are safest, which include filleting the fish, baking and grilling as opposed to frying, even though that's, I know it's really tough being in North Carolina and not <laughs> telling people not to fry fish, but uh, our recommendation is to bake or grill instead. Um, and then that magnet actually that you see right on the screen, um, we were finding that folks were not necessarily familiar with how to fillet. So uh, we kind of laid that all out in the form of a magnet. And all of these materials exist both in English and in Spanish. So you can go to the next one. We also developed a social media toolkit based around these messages um, so that other organizations or even individuals can post on their social media accounts, post these um, really beautifully designed uh, graphics that summarize all of our main messages. Uh, we also produced a video series. Um, if 
y'all are familiar with these faces that you see up here, you should definitely check out these videos. Um, or either way, you should watch them. They're great. Um, but they feature some prominent community members like Chef Keith Rhodes from Catch and Deborah Dix Maxwell, who is now um, our illustrious president of the North Carolina NAACP. Um, and uh, both videos uh, just kind of talk about our main messaging. But the uh, chef video is really amazing. It's it's almost like a chef's table. If you've ever seen that uh, Netflix show, um, kind of talking about how to prepare prepare fish and cook it. And of course, we get to see Keith in action um, cooking in that video. Um, these are some of our uh, most recent initiatives that have to do with the Stop, Check, Enjoy campaign. Um, as Bonnie introduced in the beginning, we are in the midst of Fish Consumption Month, uh, actually coming to the tail end of it, unbelievably, which is what we uh, just kind of said would be the month of March, and we were going to do this whole concerted effort um, to do a whole bunch of outreach. And so one of those big outreach pieces is the Go Fish Fest, which is happening on Sunday uh, at the New Hanover County Arboretum. It's gonna feature some really amazing speakers. We'll have a DJ, we'll have food trucks. We're gonna have some uh, games and activities for children. We're also going to be providing um, some free transportation from two spots in downtown Wilmington um, so that if folks are unable to drive cars, uh, they can get themselves to the Arboretum regardless. Um, and so we're really excited to have that event and we've been doing a whole bunch of stuff throughout the month, these presentations included, um, and we've really been trying to get our printed materials out into the world. Um, we've done some radio spots some television spots so this is really our big push, especially kind of as our mandate comes to an end. Um, so I think with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, but thank you all so much for being here and for listening. And uh, yeah, we'd love to take some questions if if we have a few minutes, either maybe in chat or you can just kind of unmute and ask. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing presentation. And I know that I uh, I learned learned a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know if you would have a um, personal pick of fish, something that you found was the least contaminated or safest fish to consume. That's a good question. I don't know. Moshkan doesn't eat fish, which I learned recently. So in terms of personal preference, I don't know that she'll have one, but maybe in terms of like safest choice, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, uh, we did talk about, you know, sunfishes are the ones we anticipated being the lowest. Uh, and bluegill was the one, had relatively lower levels, um, but at the same time, not zero. We were actually surprised with the levels of chromium that we found in bluegill. Uh, so bluegill being a sunfish, um, we assume that anything that's going to be smaller and lower on the food chain, so like other sunfishes probably have relatively lower levels. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard uh, to know like what, because we only sampled a certain number of fish, um, what the rest, like how does it actually fall out in terms of these other yeah. species? But um, I would guess that like other types of sunfish are going to be relatively low. Um, mm -hmm. but probably similar to bluegill. Um, my general recommendation is people eat fish that are smaller, so like are lower on the food chain and smaller, despite wanting to get the big fish because it's exciting. Um, sometimes it's better to go for smaller fish because they haven't accumulated as much of the toxicants as a smaller fish. They're not going to have as much. Um, so when you have that ability um, to not just go for the huge fish, I think that's a good thing, even though that might hurt our pride a little of uh, catching a big fish. That's great. That's, that's very interesting to know. And then I believe we had a question from Dick who asked, curious as to how the fish are cooked affect their contaminant concentrations. Yeah. And I put a little something in the chat, but we can kind of expand on that. Um, in terms of prep um, and cooking as well, um, we have certain types of contaminants that are considered fat loving. Um, so meaning they kind of attach to those fat cells. And so filleting 
um, and baking and grilling as opposed to frying um, reduces not only the filleting obviously cuts out a lot of those fatty parts of the fish um, and frying uh, prevents the uh, contaminants from kind of remaining trapped in the fish. Also, um, if you are going to fry, we at the very least tell you uh, or recommend not to reuse the oil that you fried in because that's where all of the contaminants are kind of going to get trapped. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Also I'm noting too that not all contaminants are stored in the fat. So you, you lose some like PCBs and dioxins through that way, but um, other contaminants like mercury don't, they're not gonna go away if you, if you uh, take out the fat, unfortunately. Right. Um, there's not really a, like do this and you'll get rid of all the mercury. Um, so uh, there's in that sense, it's, it's kind of baked in in a sense. It's, uh, <laughs> in, the, it's in the muscles of the fish too. Uh, the other question I saw somebody asked was about um, indication from the state and that they'll con whether or not they'll continue to evaluate contamination levels in order to update the recommendations, such as with blue crab or red drum. They did update the standard for red drum at that one site at, uh, near Brunswick, or uh, in the Brunswick River near Belleville, uh, but there's n we have no indication that they are planning on doing any additional testing. Um, so it's unfortunate that um, we don't know of any, now it is possible. What's cool is we went through this process and we're working on um, some documents. Like if you all wanted to do more testing, you could say, we're gonna work with some folks and come up with a plan and we wanna collect some blue crab and then have them analyzed uh, and submit that data to the Division of Public Health and they have to do something with that data. Um, so uh, there's ways that you can get involved um, as residents and citizens too. Yeah, and the comment is a kind of an apt one from Jay, and this seems like just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, in a, in a lot of ways it kind of is, or rather it's a really nuanced issue. Um, and there's a lot of ways to come at it, and there are a lot of ways to talk about it, and there are a lot of things to take into consideration as Moshkan and Abby, um, again, described really well. Um, there's just a lot of facets of it. Yeah, you know, and one, I'll say one quick comment. Um, I think what's hard about some of these things is uh, we want people to eat fish uh, and it's important and it's an environmental justice issue because people rely on this. It's a really important and healthy source of protein. Uh, but the way to do that is, you know, this research shows, I should say first, but there's contamination and there's more than we realized. And uh, if we did more, as Jan mentioned, tip of the iceberg, we'd probably find more contamination. Uh, and so what we really need to, you know, the, this is a public health side of me is like, we have to work on the prevention side, which is we have to reduce pollution. Um, that's what's really causing this is mm -hmm. the legacy of pollution from decades ago, and, but also the continuing pollution. So uh, I know you guys care about that already, but it's just kind of harking back, like all of those things matter. Yeah, this is not just for the Cape Fear. And uh, uh, were there were there any, you know, maybe recommendations or or work done in terms of um, how to best engage these communities in getting the word out, um, uh, you know, about this issue? Yeah, we, uh, we did conduct uh, several focus groups. Um, so we tried to pull in community members, especially from various subpopulations that we might be trying to target, like the Spanish speaking populations and communities. Um, yeah, it's the recommendations we got are kind of to target already existing channels of communication. So a lot of folks, especially um, in communities of color, will get their information from churches um, and from radio stations um, and bait and tackle shops. And so we tried to kind of um, target our information and our materials at those sorts of spots and then, of course, distribute them at those spots as well. Um, but we got yeah, we got varying feedback and I think it's important to note for for uh, an issue like this like Moshkan was kind of talking about is that 
this will register as as different priority levels to different people and that's okay um you know if your number one priority is getting food on the table for your family that's high in protein you know you're obviously going to choose river caught fish because it's cheap um but uh, people were were kind of recommending, yeah, that we go through trusted channels of communication, especially ones that are relevant to different um, community groups and, and demographic groups. Um, and that has that's proven to be really, uh, really effective. You kind of got to go where people are already going. Good. Very good. Always, always nice to see the the um, get some insight into how that goes on, because, of course, that's one of the most important uh, parts of this um, program is is making sure that the ones that need the information are getting the information. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then I believe we just had another comment um, mm -hmm. come in. Uh, Jan says further evidence for why we should handle emerging contaminants is dangerous until proven otherwise as not allowed discharge until studies are completed. Once the contaminant is out there, it's too late. Thank you for this, for your work and this information. I agree, Jan, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, this is really great, great work. And as you've mentioned before, um, you know, filling a, a large gap because that research hadn't been done and um, these these studies weren't out there. And so I'm really glad that we've, we've got something. And I am a huge fan of all the printed materials um, and uh, uh, we have some at the office, but we'll be distributing those out as well um, to some different sites, but uh, great job on those printed materials. And of course, I, everything that's gone into this, this program. Yeah, thank you all. And I did drop, I can drop it again, um, a link all the way at the top um, to all of our Stop, Chuck, Enjoy materials. Um, and it should link also to our kind of Fish Consumption Month webpage where you can find out more information about the uh, rest of the events that are coming up this month. Well, thank you so much, Kiara and Mushkan and Abigail. I'm so pleased that we were able to gather tonight and 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 really uh, uh, get educated on this topic. Uh, I hope the event on Sunday is a big success. I hope everyone can make it out there um, and that it's perfect weather. <laughs> and, <laughs> thank uh, you. <laughs> again, great location, perfect location for that event. So um, uh, enjoy. And uh, we look forward to uh, working with you more in the future. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks, Bonnie, yeah. for having us. And thank you, thank everyone, you guys for coming. Thank you for spending thank your you. Wednesday evening with us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, mm -hmm. y'all. Bye.